Now, heaven knows how much silver is really flowing out of the world's exchanges and backdooring out of the ETFs or how much the U.S. government is accumulating. But whatever it is, it's all being done at an artificial price until it's not. And until the, the supply demand fundamentals overwhelm, and I really do believe we are entering that period of time, in particular with rising rates putting greater and greater and greater strain on a banking system that will ignite the fuse of reality to a lot of people. And you could argue by that time, the market is so confused and so leveraged and so upside down that It'll be very difficult for most people to protect themselves in something like silver. It's very obvious. Look, if JP Morgan, if, if what they did was so egregious to where they put two or three of their traders, including Michael Nowak, who ran the desk in prison, then why were they allowed to continue to run the world's largest silver trust? Why was their fine $920 million, but their desk made a billion dollars that year? They walk away 80 million up. No worse for the wear. It's a company that makes a billion in profit a month. There's no question that they're behind it, but the bigger issue to me is the fact that, and the reason you don't hear bitching around the world is that this is falling into the hands of the, the countries around the world that are accumulating it at subsidized prices, allowing a country like India to import over 300 million ounces. The market is so confused and so leveraged and so upside down that it'll be very difficult for most people to protect themselves in something like silver when there is a mass awakening by the public. And I do believe it starts with the banks. I think that is the fuse that, that lights the banks. I mean, even talking the, the commercial banks, they hold right now, uh, right now they have over $7 trillion in uninsured deposits, just the top four commercial banks. So, you know, we're, excuse me, that's global, that's total. The, the top four commercial banks over, over 4.185 trillion in uninsured deposits. I mean, one of these banks goes and gets bailed in and the whole fuse of chaos is set off immediately where everything that we know to be true about market fundamentals and dynamics and prices and suppression all change. And I have a feeling when that happens, companies like JP Morgan are gonna be on the long side and uh, they've suckered as much as they can you know, to shake the weak hands, the money managers off the tree again. But when that moment happens, I'll bet you dollars to donuts that a bank like JP Morgan will be on the long side and, and it will put companies like it did Bear Stearns out of business very quickly. If the banks are forced to sell it, you have many, many eager participants around the world standing okay. ready to take delivery, take the other side of that, that sale and stand for delivery. That's the type of moment that I've seen for a long time. Now, Maybe I have a curse of seeing things like you do long before they actually come to fruition, but the mathematics of it don't lie. And we're going to reach that point that that Rubicon has to be crossed at some point. Question is, how far are we from it? Don't know, but I will venture to say that when you see the commercial banks start lining up again on the long side in this environment where rates keep rising, look, I don't think one out of 100 people in this country understand what a bail-in is or, or that it's law and was written into the Dodd-Frank Act. And, you know, it's one thing for us to talk about the frailty of all the markets and protect yourself with silver, et cetera, but it's another thing for people to lose everything in a bank account that they think is safe. Well, I'm not going to be in stocks or bonds. That's too risky. I just leave it in a bank in a CD. Well, boom. And then like, oh my God, what's a bail-in? What? It's law? Are you kidding me? When did that happen? And I think that that's the catalyst. And then when you realize that the number two in charge of economic theory at, at, uh, for the White House, Lael Brainerd, that's what she wants. She's a modern monetary theorist. Call the banks. Well, that's how you do it. You blow up some banks and let them get bailed in and, and it becomes chaos immediately. And I, I, everything that is true right now changes. Point, not only does it blow up those banks, but the act of running to the banks means they have to sell their treasuries or put rates up higher, which kills more banks. It feeds upon itself. And if you were that diabolical to do this, to, to reset the system, to blow up the banks, to issue a CBDC, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll make you whole. Sign on the dotted line, take the new CBDC, and you know, you'll get your money back. Well, there's your event. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen this week or next week, but that's what I see as the ultimate endgame. If you look at how else do you get people to take a CBDC, most people don't want it. I mean, parts of the world, they're burning down the banks that 
that, you know, where they're being told they're rolling out a CBDC. People don't want it. So you have to have an event that makes people accept it. And we're in, our banks are so leveraged right now with over 7 trillion in uninsured deposits. I mean, that's a, a fuse, you know, uh, coated in kerosene, just waiting for a cigarette to be dropped on it. The precious metals markets are significantly influenced by a small group of bullion banks, motivated by their vested interest in supporting the Western financial system. Andy asserts that the bond market is particularly susceptible to the influence of these banks, and convincing those who deny this fact can be quite challenging. Nevertheless, individuals well informed about this manipulation understand the far-reaching implications accompanying declines in precious metal prices. For instance, even as silver prices fell on Thursday amidst weakness in the U.S. dollar, traders maintained a bearish outlook on precious metals, largely due to the recent surge in nominal and real U.S. yields. And he suggests that among those who are well-informed, there is a growing sense that a significant financial reckoning may be approaching. Those who fail to recognize the imminent dangers lurking within traditional assets, such as bank accounts and treasuries, could be caught off guard. Let's get back to the interview. If you deny the fact that the metals markets are controlled by a handful of bullion banks with a vested interest of supporting the Western system, the bond market, um, you know, at this point, it's a lost cause to try and convince you. The people that were there understand it. And if anything, it energizes them when the price falls. They understand what it truly means. And I think there's a feeling that we're getting close to that moment. And, you know, We've been saying that forever. I, I, you know, I'm the little boy who cried wolf. I'm on the cover of that book. We all are. But the, the wolf does come at the end. And I think people are beginning to sense that. They feel that not just in silver's uh, relative underperformance, but just in everything around us uh, on a large scale. And the people who don't see what's coming w will not have the ability to get out of the way of it. And I talked a lot about that. So you know, I think you can only save the world, Bix, one person at a time, starting with yourself. But when you look around and see the macro picture, if you don't see the danger in traditional assets, in bank accounts, in, in treasuries, which, you know, the fall in the 10-year treasury amounts to one of the largest drops in recorded market history. And, and it's just beginning, in my opinion. So, yeah, there's a lot to be bullish about.